Soul songs, what we're looking at. Soul songs in the book of Psalms, yeah? And what sort of subject matter inspires the best songs? Love. Love, yeah. Love. And being, and being love lorn, yeah? Being forsaken in love, broken hearted, hardship, difficulty, poverty, hard times, misery, depression. These are basically the stuff of great art. Yeah? They are. I mean, Mozart. How could Mozart develop the, the, the musical stuff? I mean, it's radical in his day. How could he develop all that kind of tragic life? Adele has said she's too happy at the moment to write any songs. Adele? Thank you. Adele, <laughs> on the radio. What a wonderful... Can everybody stop heckling that? But that's really good. <laughs> Adele. Adele has said recently <coughs> she's not coming up with any songs because she's had a baby and stuff like that. And she's so ecstatically happy she can't produce songs. She can't sing. She's too happy. Often that is the way it works. The stuff great art and great ballads are made of is misery and depression and hardship and life's rubbish. Yeah? yeah? And often in the Psalms, that is pretty much the way it works out. Look at Psalm 88. That is as grim as it gets. That is a bad day. But not this Psalm. Not Psalm 23. Psalm 23 sings of sufficiency and satisfaction. And you know, the big shock is that it is a human being who's singing this song. Because human beings don't work like that. Do they? No. How does it begin? Oh, family came round. Yeah. <laughs> when the beach it rained. You know, that's human nature, isn't it? And here is a guy, counter to human nature, counter to what we normally see of human experience. And he's singing a song, and he's singing a satisfaction. Psalm 23, the song of satisfaction. It is unnatural for human beings to be satisfied, let alone to sing of their satisfaction. And also because of the nature of human pride, it is utterly unusual, isn't it, for a human to sing of their satisfaction, placing themselves inside that piece of non-literal language, as a well-shepherded sheep. I am a sheep. Huh? We don't sing like that. We are leaders. I'm sorry, this is, a, this is a cultural reference that you could take in a derogative fashion, please don't. Well, maybe do, but, but this, is a, this is a problem. All the stuff coming out of America at the moment, all the big blog sites, all the big pastors, leadership, be a leader. You can't build a church completely of leaders. But this goes to me about being a sheep and his dependency on a shepherd. Something rather unusual is going on. It's this unusual sort of song of satisfaction, the song of a satisfied, self-confessed sheep. It's all unusual. So this song is alien to most human experience. See, we're so familiar with it. Oh, yes, Psalm 23, Cremond. Oh, Lord, my shepherd. We had that at our wedding, you know. Yeah. So, you know, we're so but it's such an unusual thing to be happening. I want us to see that. Here's the fundamental fact that sets the psalmist up as a satisfied man. You can almost stop there. Here's the key to it. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. What's the authorised? Come on, tell me what you used to. Come on. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. It's fair enough. That's in the same sort of ballpark, isn't it? Except one is good news for modern man and one is good news for Neanderthal man. Right? That's about where we're at, isn't it? Okay, it's the same thing. We're okay with that. Here's the fundamental fact that sets the psalmist up as a satisfied man. And here's the fundamental feature of this psalm. The psalmist relates to the Lord as a sheep to the best shepherd imaginable. Which means that all his needs are satisfied and more. In fact, his cup flows over the top. Some of us might consider that a waste. So what have we got going on here? Covenant God is my shepherd. Crucial. Crucial start. We'll come back to it. The divine name. You know, Jehovah, Yahweh, the name you can't say but we try to. Right? That one. He is my shepherd. The covenant keeping God. The faithful one. The covenant God. The shepherd 
of Israel. There is a profoundly theological and a profoundly salvation history foundation to the psalmist's satisfaction. The one who's my shepherd is the one who's been a covenant keeping God throughout the ages to Israel, to his people. He's the one. He's the one who's proved himself all the time through history and the experience of the people of God to bring them through every dark valley. And the most fundamental dark valley of all. The valley of death. And that idea of God as his people's shepherd, the covenant God, goes right back to Genesis 49. Joseph's a fruitful vine, of what fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall, is he? No, it's a piece of non-literal language. But look, you've got the picture. Yeah, wow, that's some sort of vine, isn't it? That one's soaking up the nutrients. That one's getting the sun. That one's doing good. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility, but his bow remained steady. His strong arm stayed supple because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you. Because of the Almighty, who blesses you. Now there's nothing distinctive about this metaphor of the shepherd in Scripture. It's used in a number of other Psalms, Psalm 77, Psalm 18, verse 2, Psalm 95, verse 7, on and on and on. It's not unusual in Israel's history to think of God as Israel's shepherd. But what really stands out here in this Psalm, Psalm 23, is the use of the personal pronoun. The Lord is, not Israel's shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. And that's a big deal. That's a stunning, shocking. So we see, this is it. We're up against this all the time. We are so used to the Lord is my shepherd. But you know, as soon as somebody reads that Psalm, Psalm 23, the day it's written, what? Are you kidding? My shepherd? And that's the unique contribution of this in Scripture. The shepherd of Israel has become my shepherd. And in the words of the old Welsh hymn, you know, thou shepherd of Israel, my. Shepherd of Israel and mine. The joy and desire of my heart. The closer communion I pine, I long to resign where thou art. There's the point. Thou shepherd of Israel and mine. My, I, I. That's what's distinctive in this here. The Lord is my shepherd. So there's a profoundly theological Salvation history foundation to the psalmist's satisfaction. It goes back a long way. It's a solid, sure foundation. But there's a profoundly personal and experiential, in my experience, foundation to it too. And we make a serious mistake <coughs> when our faith is not profoundly theological, based on revealed truth. Salvation historical, based on what God has been known to do. And personal. And in my experience, day by day, experiential too. The Lord is my shepherd. Is this, should we use the rest of our time on that? <laughs> you know? Theological, because it is in response to his self-revelation in Scripture, and on the basis of the truth that he reveals in it, that Christians have life and liberty and anything worth calling Christian. Salvation history, because revelation has been progressive up until the sending of the Saviour. None of this began with us. It's been progressive up to the sending of the Saviour, the Spirit, the canon of Scripture. We're not the first to follow you. Personal, because God holds each individual responsible personally for the way we've kicked against him. The soul that sins shall die, he says, but the soul that turns from sin to follow the Saviour is going to be saved and saved forevermore. My sin is not anyone else's problem, not anyone else's responsibility, it's mine. But the soul that turns from sin to follow the Saviour is going to be saved forevermore, and if that's me, that he is mine. The Lord is my shepherd, it's personal, and it's experiential because a theoretical what do we know about theoretical Christianity we come in here? Too much? A theoretically repenting, believing person cannot say the Lord is my shepherd. It's not your shepherd. You can sing it in the hymns, you can sing it in the services you go to every now and again. It's not true. 
It's not until you've got that personal experience of the Lord as your shepherd can you say the Lord is my shepherd. A theoretical shepherd is no use to you. He won't feed you, he won't dip you, he won't trim your feet and he won't give you a drink, right? It's part of a theoretical shepherd. Now that, says the psalmist, is the key to personal needs met and satisfaction secured. He's singing of satisfaction with all these issues that are going to arise now because the Lord is his shepherd. This is what follows from him. That's what he's got to say. And here's how it works. On our own, we're like sheep out of the flock, wandering, vulnerable, alone, the sad prospect of the sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is moved by that, isn't he? He looks at the people and he says, you're like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 9, Jesus went through all the towns and villages. That's very important. Jesus was concerned about villages. Good. Teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and illness, and when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they needed a health service. No. Not because they needed the health service, but because they were harassed and they were helpless and they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers of you ask the Lord of the harvest to send that workers into his harvest field. Because they're like sheep without a shepherd. See, the unshepherded sheep is in a pretty poor position. Overgrown feet. Foot rot. Riddled with worms. Maggots. Who's going to defend the sheep against these things? Because it cannot defend itself against them. We've got the sheep near us in this state. Somebody owns them. Oh yes, somebody owns them. But in practical terms, nobody shepherds them. One crawled up on our door, kitchen doorstep and died the other day. Yeah, fly strike, full of maggots, killed it. Came over there it was. Sheep without a shepherd is a miserable beast. It's grim. We don't get that because we're so, you know, we're so used to Cremond. We're so used to what we sing at the funerals and weddings. You know, you sing it quickly at the wedding, you sing it slowly at the funeral. But it's the same thing, isn't it? The Lord's more shepherd. Good, because a sheep without a shepherd is a miserable beast. But the psalmist is clear that the Lord is his shepherd. Shepherdless sheep have got problems with parasites, they've got problems with overheating because they haven't been shorn. They've got rest and security issues because who's protecting them from all the predators that are out there? They've got a problem with direction, they just wander. Wander about. They've got issues with food and water and where they're going to find them. And what's, what's going to become of them? They're going to die in a ditch somewhere? That's the trouble with shepherdless sheep, they're miserable beasts. But the psalmist is clear that because the Lord is his shepherd, he is going to lack nothing. See the contrast, it's a huge contrast. We don't get it usually. The consequence is explicit in the construction in the Hebrew. So long as the Lord is my shepherd, I suffer no lack. It's not a future tense. It's not a future. That's sadly, no. But there is this consequential thing. So long as the Lord is my shepherd, given that the Lord is my shepherd, because of that, as a consequence of that, I'm going to lack nothing. Because of the kind of shepherd that he is. Now there the psalmist has stated his premise, and the rest of the psalm, we're going to go through fairly quickly, because it just unpacks the rest of it.